historic town of Mostar, spanning a deep valley of the Naredba River, developed in the 15th and 16th centuries as an Ottoman frontier town, and during the Austro-Hungarian period in the 19th and 20th centuries. Mostar has long been known for its old Turkish houses and old bridge, Stari Most, after which it is named. In the 1990s conflict, however, most of the historic town and the old bridge, designed by the renowned architect Sining, was destroyed. The old bridge was recently rebuilt, and many of the edifices in the old town have been restored or rebuilt, with the contribution of an international scientific committee established by UNESCO. The old bridge area, with its pre-Ottoman, Eastern Ottoman, Mediterranean, and Western European architectural features, is an outstanding example of a multicultural urban settlement. The reconstructed old bridge in old city of Mostar is a symbol of reconciliation, international cooperation, and of the coexistence of diverse cultural, ethnic, and religious communities. Flipping a coin may not be the fairest way to settle disputes. About a decade ago, statistician Percy Diaconis started to wonder if the outcome of a coin flip really is just a matter of chance. He had Harvard University engineers build him a mechanical coin flipper. Diaconis, now at Stanford University, found that if a coin is launched exactly the same way, it lands exactly the same way. The randomness in a coin toss, it appears, is introduced by sloppy humans. Each human generated flip has a different height and a different speed, and is caught at a different angle, giving different outcomes. But using high speed cameras and equations, Diaconis and colleagues have now found that even though humans are largely unpredictable coin flippers, there is still a bias built in. If a coin starts out heads, it ends up heads when caught more often than it does tails. NPR's David Kestenbaum reports.
This is Scientific American's 60 Second Science. I'm Christopher Intagliata. The sound of a cracking knee isn't particularly pleasant, but it gets worse when you listen up close. It does for most people, but for me, it's, it, it actually just makes me excited. Omar Inan, an electrical engineer at Georgia Tech. I actually feel like there's some real information in them that can be exploited for the purposes of helping people with rehab. Enon's experience with cracking knees goes back to his days as an undergrad at Stanford, where he threw discus. If I had a really hard workout, then the next day, of course, I'd be sore. But I would also sometimes feel that I would feel this basically catching or popping or creaking every now and then in my knee. A few years later, he found himself building tiny microphones at a high-end audio company. So when he got to Georgia Tech and heard the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, or DARPA, wanted better tech for knee injuries, he thought, why not strap tiny microphones to people's knees to eavesdrop as their legs bend? What we think it is, is the cartilage and bone rubbing against each other, the surfaces inside the knee rubbing against each other during those movements. He and a team of physiologists and engineers built a prototype with stretchy athletic tape and a few tiny mics and skin sensors. And preliminary tests on athletes suggest the squishy sounds the device picks up are more erratic and more irregular in an injured knee than in a healthy one, which Enon says might allow patients and doctors to track healing after surgery. Details appear in the IEEE transactions on biomedical engineering. The primary application we're targeting at first is to give people a decision aid during rehabilitation following an acute knee injury to help them understand when they can perform particular activities and when they can move to different intensities of particular activities. A useful thing to take a crack at. Thanks for listening. For some- The comics I show you with lots of people chatting around in a room is a form of description. We use different kinds of methods to describe a situation. Sometimes we have to use visual description, particularly when we do not witness the scenario. I was born during the Second World War, and my hometown is X. For example, when I ask my mother about the war, I always ask her, you have mentioned this or that, when you talked to me, when you asked her about the shelter. I asked her what the shelter looks like and when did you go to the shelter. From her response, I could get more visual evidence as I can to write my book.
Stages of Brain Development During Childhood There are three stages, starting from the primitive brain, limbic brain, and finally to the neocortex. Although interrelated, the three had its own function, primitive brain functions to manage the physical to survive, manage reflex, motor motion control, monitoring body functions, and process information coming from sensing. Limbic brain functioning is a liaison to process emotions and the brain thinks, and the primitive brain, while the thinking brain, which is the most objective part of the brain, receiving input from the primitive brain and the limbic brain. However, he needed more time to process information from the primitive brain and the limbic brain. The brain thinks a merger is also a place of experience, memory, feeling, and thinking ability to give birth to ideas and actions. Nerve myelination of the brain takes place in sequence, starting from the primitive brain, the limbic brains, and brain thought. Neural pathways are more frequently used to make more myelin thicken. Increasingly thicker myelin, the faster the nerve impulses or signals travel along nerves. Therefore, a growing child is encouraged to receive input from the environment in accordance with its development. The Right Honorable Sir Winston Leonard Spencer Churchill was a British statesman, best known as Prime Minister of the United Kingdom during the Second World War. At various times a soldier, journalist, author, and politician, Churchill is generally regarded as one of the most important leaders in British and world history. Considered reactionary on some issues, such as granting independence to Britain's colonies, and at times regarded as a self-promoter who changed political parties to further his career. It was his wartime leadership that earned him iconic status. Some of his peacetime decisions, such as restoring the gold standard in 1924, were disastrous, as was his World War I decision to land troops on the Dardanelles. However, during 1940, when Britain alone opposed Hitler's Nazi Germany in the free world, his stirring speeches inspired, motivated, and uplifted a whole people during their darkest hours. Churchill saw himself as a champion of democracy against tyranny and was profoundly aware of his own role and destiny. Indeed, he believed that God had placed him on earth to carry out heroic deeds for the protection of Christian civilization and human progress. A providential understanding of history would concur with Churchill's self-understanding. Considered old-fashioned, even reactionary by some people today, he was actually a visionary whose dream was of a united world, beginning with a union of the English-speaking peoples, then embracing all cultures. In his youth, he cut a dashing figure as a cavalry officer as seen in the 1972 film Young Winston, directed by Richard Attenborough, but the images of him that are most widely remembered are as a rather overweight, determined, even pugnacious looking senior state statesman as he is depicted to the right.
there is a lot of interesting what forms these clouds why are these clouds there why do they sort of stick around at the center every cloud drop has a particle you can't grow a cloud drop without having a particle there for the water to condense on the key question that people not directly address until very recently is what actually forms these clouds so for once you're looking out at over the ocean turns out sea spray sea salt is a very effective nucleus for forming clouds so it's a really good chance that those are loaded with sea salt but if you go inland you start to have pollution come from all kinds of places and so different and. sources form clouds more effectively than others and we're trying to unravel which sources are actually contributing to the clouds the clouds are incredibly important players in climate change and that they reflect the white they reflect the light back into space and so they're keeping things much much cooler than they would be if they weren't there they also play a huge role in regional weather so in actuality we're starting to see shifts where having more pollution input into the clouds is affecting weather patterns in particular is actually reducing the precipitation so we're starting to see drought in areas with super high levels of air pollution In 2008, Melbourne joined the UNESCO Creative Cities Network, when it was designated the first and only city of literature in Australia, and the second of its kind in the world. Melbourne's designation as a UNESCO City of Literature was an acknowledgement of the breadth, depth and vibrancy of the city's literary culture. Melbourne supports a diverse range of writers, a prosperous publishing industry, a successful culture of independent bookselling, a wide variety of literary organizations, and a healthy culture of reading and engagement with events and festivals. But Aristotle says the reason we need rhetoric is we have to be able to use it. To use rhetoric influence the ramble. We try to get them to understand truth. Truth is suggest. It's different than rhetoric. Rhetoric is the dressing, is the body, right? Truth is the spirit, is the soul, is abstract. It doesn't have a body. It's not particular. 
If you want to get somebody to the truth, you might have to use some kind of tricks, right? Because most of people are not sound and can see the truth. That's what we think. Most people are rambles, really. Only the educated, be erudite, are actually capable of seeing the truth. If you want to get the general mass there, you may have to do a little bit. So Aristotle, that is rhetoric. Rhetoric is something that is used to influence people, right? And it's kind of mentally promised a logic. How often does a civilization occur? By studying that, we could look at stars that are suitable for the development of civilizations. How many new stars appear every year? 7. But some stars are too cold and some are too hot. Only about 20% can be considered as suitable. We all know that there are some factors for species and animals to survive and reproduce, including environmental conditions, temperature, tolerance range, body size, weight, diets, seasonal and daily activity, behavior, and the altitude they live animals migrate to find a new habitat because the change of environment and only species that have the tolerance for the new environment could survive and reproduce. Human beings are the only organism that makes extensive use of technology to extend the limits of their natural tolerance extend. range. I'm a dietitian and I work in clinical weight loss research. Accurately estimating portion size is critical in research or real world settings. For example, if you're trying to watch your weight and you're out to dinner and you're presented with a bowl of food, there's no really good way to actually estimate how much you're eating unless you're going to whip some scales out of your bag. So we wanted to find a more objective way for people to quantify what they're eating when they're out and about. I came up with a more hands-on approach. We got people to measure the dimensions of the food using the width of their fingers. And remembering back to primary school maths, we used the geometric volume formulas to estimate the weight of the food. To show you how this works, I've ordered a piece of lasagna, and that's my box, a glass of wine, and that's my cylinder, and I'm feeling pretty healthy, so I order some watermelon for dessert. 
and that's my wedge. So this lasagna is 7 by 5 by 4 fingers. In the future, I see this method being incorporated into smartphone applications. So you put your finger widths in along with your height and your weight and the app will do all of the calculations for you. And then you've got a more accurate way to estimate the portion size. Innovation equals invention and let me just stop here innovation equals invention often people mistake these two things for the same thing innovation equals invention they are not Innovation is something that generates value for the world. It makes something faster, better, cheaper. It gives someone some great satisfaction. An invention is an idea, a technology, a patent. In and of itself, it does not generate value. So these two are not the same thing. And sometimes you see them interchange, and that's not correct. So innovation equals invention times commercialization. So, and when we look at this equation of innovation, something of value, it requires a new idea, and then it requires some, someone or some organization that is going to commercialize that idea and to make it of value to the world. What I've decided to provide is the steps that I take when analysing my own questionnaires. However, before I begin, it would be useful to remind you of a few terms we use when talking about questionnaires. Questions can be divided into three types. This is sometimes called level of measurement. Firstly, 
we have category type questions, which are also known as nominal questions. These are when participants select from a list of categories for their response, such as male or female, or they may include ethnic origin. Secondly, we have ordinal type questions. These are similar to category questions, but instead of the categories being independent, there is some sort of order between them. If we ask people to indicate their age in categories, this is an ordinal type question. Thirdly, we have continuous questions. These are any question that can be answered by a number. It could be an open-ended question asking participants to tell you how many times they attended lectures or how often they used a VLE or it could involve asking them to write the importance or intensity of some experience. Milk is not typical of all monasteries for many reasons. First, it is very grand, which most, especially later foundations, aren't. Secondly, it was founded in the countryside, whereas in the 17th and 18th centuries, a good proportion of foundations were made in towns. Thirdly, it still owns a substantial amount of land, because fourthly, it lies in the Austrian Republic, the only European country where grand old monasteries have been in continuous existence since they were founded, 900, 1,000, even in one case 1,200 years ago. We're thinking about this and we're trying to say, all right, well, let's file a patent on this clicker. If I were to go to the patent office and say, all right, I want a patent on a clicker, period. The patent office would just laugh. You know, the clickers have been around for a while. Presentation clickers have been around for a while. And so there'd be a 0% <coughs> chance that we would actually get that. If we were to somehow convince the patent office that we should be able to get a patent on a clicker, period, it would, however, be incredibly valuable every single p clicker that was um, made after this point would infringe 
and when it infringes, maybe we take a one or two dollars each. And that would add up to be a decent amount of money. On the other end of the spectrum, let's go to the million word version. I go to the patent office and I say, I want a patent on this exact thing. And those million words describe every single radius, every single um, uh, material, every single thing about this. And the patent office says, yeah, we've never seen that before. Go ahead and take it. Almost 100% chance of getting that patent. But the value of that patent would be close to zero 